of not being ashamed is that all their flaws was out. Everything was out and they were willing to do what? To let it out regardless of what was going on. Regardless of the situation, they were willing to reveal themselves to each other because they were going to help and build each other. But today, everybody's hiding their flaws. So there are couples that compete with one another. They compete with each other because everybody thinks they're better than the other person. Amos 3.3, can two walk together except they be agreed? What are they agreeing on? And in my book, I talk about they agree on the word of God. You got to agree on something. All right. So you change your mind. Number one, number two, you anchor in something else. You need to anchor in something greater than you. Even in addiction recovery programs, they tell you that you need something greater than yourself to do what to overcome addiction. And it's not a human. <laughs> Even in addiction recovery programs, they talk about, I will say God without using the word God because they have to appeal to everybody. But you need something greater than you. You need something else outside of you. And maybe in their own terms, it could be your children, your family, your marriage, something outside of you. But what I read from that is that something outside of you is God, something greater than you. Because another human is not necessarily greater than you, right? So I read it as something greater than you is, is God to help you overcome. Because addiction is real. Addiction is difficult. So to be able to go over and for you know move on from the addiction, it's going to take a lot of discipline. It's going to take a lot of encouragement. It's going to take something greater than you. <laughs> because at this point, you've lost your ability to make a decision. You've lost your ability because you're you're at first you're like, oh, I'm going to get high a little bit. And after a while, you can't even control how much high you get, right? Or how drunk you get. You can't control that. So for that very reason, you need something else to help you through the journey of that, all right? So that's that, that's number two. And what are you gonna anchor yourself in? You may say, but I go to church, we go to church together. Let me tell you, the majority of the people I personally know, whether as clients or whether as family, friends, they were not strong in their faith. So they married someone not thinking about what the person will contribute to their faith or how they were going to raise their children. The majority of the people I know. That's the truth. Statistically speaking, <laughs> you know, they, they, they did not necessarily think about what, what is my home going to look like? You were not strong in the Lord. So you got up and you chose a man that you fell in love with. But knowing that, Love really isn't enough for marriage. If you've been married at least a year or two, you will quickly recognize the first thing that goes out is romance. That's the first thing that goes out of a marriage is romance. Until you come to that place of companionate love. Companionate love is the love that's based on friendship. Based on friendship. Companionship. And when you're, you have a friend, friends... Tell each other the truth. Friends are helpful. Friends are there for one another. You understand? So it's very important that as you're processing, um, guys, I said I was going to be here until 10. So that's another 20 minutes. If you have a question, there's a question mark at the bottom. Feel free to put your questions in there. I will answer it. Um, and you can also follow the page if you're not following it yet. Maybe someone shared the page with you and you're here, but you want to follow, follow the Facebook page and follow the Instagram as well, Coach Yeboah. And that's my name on YouTube as well. So anyway, please ensure to anchor in something else. So because you didn't have an anchor when you got married, now you need an anchor. That means going back to the basics. Okay, I was raised as a Christian. Maybe I was going to church, but I didn't really believe. You go back to God. Because marriage is between a, a man, a woman, and God. It's, a, it's three people. There's a covenant. And that covenant, the third person at the base is God. But we forget God. We take God out of marriage because we think we can do it with love. Love won't save your marriage. I can tell you that a million times over. Love will not sustain. What love does, it may give you a bit of patience. 
<laughs> to go on to the next fight. You know what I mean? But love in itself, unless it's based on the love of God, which is unconditional. Because the love of God is what can make you talk about 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Okay? That's the kind of love that it says love does not boast. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is this. Love is that. That's that's the part. I think it's verse 5 to 8 or something like that. That is the part. All right? If your love is agape love, is based on unconditional love of the Father, then trust me, you do not count the wrongs. You, you don't hold your partner to any wrongs. You don't hold grudges. You forgive quickly. Because you love easily, okay? But if it's not based on that kind of love, and it was, oh, I love her, she's beautiful, I like her, that love ain't gonna last. That's what we call the romantic love. It's based on lust, a bit of lust, right? Which is fine, you know? You can lust after your wife. I mean, that's your wife, that's your husband, whatever the case may be. But if that's how you enter the marriage, you gotta go back to something else. And that is why for believers, you have to go back and anchor yourself in the Lord. The reason you have to anchor yourself in the Lord is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 54, verse 17, it says, is it 57? 54, verse 17. No, that's not correct. I think it's 57, verse 5. Let me, let me quickly go to it. Go to it. In the book of Isaiah, I think it's 54, <laughs> but I don't know why 54 is so strong in my mind, but it talks about, it says, I am thy maker, thine husband. That's one of my favorite scriptures. You know, I am thy maker. Yes, yeah, 54 verse 5. I don't know where I got 17 from. It says 54 verse 5, for thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the thy redeemer, the holy one of Israel. The day I read that scripture, and it was such a timely scripture. You know, I came to the Lord and I was like, I'm tired of this. Like, I'm tired. Like, what should I do right now? And that's the scripture that he gave me. I'm thy maker, thine husband. And what God was saying is that I need you to anchor in me. You need to anchor in something else beyond your spouse. Many of us make our spouse the beginning and the end. Our spouses are not God. Our spouses are not the ones that should bring us joy and peace and comfort. It's nice. But if you depend on your spouse for that, they will fail you in the times you need them the most. The day you really want to just lean on somebody's shoulder, that's the day they want to give you an attitude. <laughs> They're very inconsistent, right? We're human. So you cannot... Place all of your eggs in your spouse and say, make me happy. You will be one miserable person. So your joy, your peace, your happiness has to be based on something else. So you anchor yourself in something else. And for me, it was going to God. So yes, it, I'm, I'm telling you because I'm not one of those who was getting married and had a list of Christian values that I want. No. <laughs> you know, I have values probably based on Christian biblical principles but when the bible says do not be unequally yoked that wasn't like my top of the line like number one don't be unequally yoked like it wasn't what i had do you understand what i'm saying so the bottom line remains that if that wasn't your top priority when you as you get into the marriage you realize that that little verse of do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers it becomes very significant as you go through in your marriage. It becomes very significant. You're going to begin to see why the Bible said what it said. Okay. So it's very important as a person that you do all you can. Like if you're already in the marriage, how do I come out of this? Anchor yourself in something else. Because you see, the easy answer will be for me to tell you, go ahead and get a divorce. Because I have cont contemplated divorce myself. I'm not going to stay here and tell you that, um, you, you know, that's not the easy answer. That's the first thing that comes to mind because you're like, just leave this person and move on. <laughs> like, but you're going to start over with who? Unless you can guarantee that the next person is going to be a clean slate. Right? 
So every time I, I talk, I have to always put a disclaimer. We're not talking abuse. We're not talking dangerous situations. We're not talking none of those things. We're talking about regular marital issues that people don't want to heal. So they deal with issues like that. That's what we're talking about. All right. So let me put that disclaimer out there because I don't want nobody coming at me talking about, oh, what if you're not safe in the relationship? Okay. If you're not safe, then please go find safety. Right. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about basic issues in marriage. All right. So what did I say? Anchor yourself in something else. That's what the Lord told me. Anchor myself. So he told me, he reassured me in Isaiah. All these years I've been married, I didn't see the scripture. But when I needed it the most, when I said, okay, divorce has to be what, the, it's time for divorce. That is where he was like, no, I am thy maker, thine husband. I made you, I'm your husband. <laughs> so if you can't see God as your husband, forget it. Don't try to go see a man as your husband. Once you see him as a husband and you put him first, then you can go and put a stranger first. It's true. It's true. And it's such a hard concept because you're like, but that's not right. I don't get it. We got married for this. and But you can't demand because what you got married for, you made a choice. And I do a training called, what does it mean to say I do? And I'm going to, you know, if you guys want to see it, please Post it below and I will definitely reteach that training or come live and talk about what does it mean to say I do. It's a very brief training, but it's so crucial that you have to understand what you stood for. When you said I do, it wasn't I do when they are good. I do when they are great. I do when they're... No, it's you said I do. <laughs> and I, I go through and I explain what the vows mean and everything. So... Marriage is sacrifice. So in order, if you're in a marriage, that's like dead end. It seems like a dead end. Um, it's not every marriage that may seem hopeful. But as a believer, there's so many avenues, so many issues that you have to consider. You know, and I know the first thing we say is, oh, what about the children? Yes, the children is a reason a lot of people stay married. But what one thing you have to also understand is if the relationship is truly toxic and you're not working on it, the children are better off outside the relationship. I'm telling you. Because you're damaging the kids. Because I have never heard of anybody say, my parents were divorced and they were the best, you know, they were the best people ever. And uh, No, never heard it. My parents were divorced and I just wish they were divorced sooner. <laughs> my parents were divorced and this is what I went through. Like, there's always that negative element there were also children that wish their parents had not gotten divorced because they're like the things they went through was not even that deep it was just two adults that were immature and sometimes that's what it is you're both immature you're both uh prideful and you're both not willing to put each other first if i'm putting you first and you're putting me first why should we even have an issue if i'm doing to you what i won't do to myself there's a problem there. Do you understand? So we keep thinking 50%, 50. It's not 50. You make marriage 50%, it's not going nowhere. Everything is 100%. Give your all. Give your all. And peace will come when you give your all. All right? The last one, okay? And then I will share my story with you. The last one is lead, don't plead. So stop begging. You know, and I and I, when I say this, I'm speaking to women mostly because women, because we love to talk, we always think about your own relationship. Are you the one that always says we need to talk? Oh, we got to talk. Oh, there's something I got to tell you. Oh, let's sit down. If you have a man that already has ego issues, this man feels like you're controlling everything. Yeah, this man is going to feel like you control everything because... They're never bothered by anything. It's like you don't even allow them to process the things that they do wrong. So they will never come up. And it's true. Don't get me wrong. I also know there are men that won't ever say anything. So you could be in a relationship where the man is just like, it will say nothing. Okay? Whether they're bothered, whether there's an issue, they will say nothing. That's also not healthy. But women, we keep thinking we can make we can make men. Yes, we create 
humanity inside of us by the grace of God, right? But at the same time, you cannot make a man. Let me explain why you can't make a man. Men are stubborn by nature. And when I tell you that a man knows what he wants, like you can cheat on a, a, a man can cheat on a woman and the woman would think about everything and decide, okay, I'm staying. Try to cheat on your husband and see what happens. <laughs> Don't try this at home. But what I'm saying is men are not cut out. He Listen, the majority of men that let go of a cheating relationship are so many. I'm telling you that. Statistically speaking, a lot of men don't stay with women that have cheated on them. They don't, I mean, most men don't have the capacity. It's like, no, I can't do it. You understand? That's why I said it takes a broken man to cheat on a spouse. I, that's what I keep saying that. Because you can't handle it, but you're going to do it to somebody else. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I don't even want to get into it. We'll talk about infidelity another time. But understand that you can't make someone, you can't force your spouse to go to church with you. You can't force them to pray with you. And usually all the relationship where there's no more prayer, it's always been, oh, the husband doesn't want to pray with me. It's true. Like, and therapy, when I used to be a therapist, you know, marriage therapist, counselor, it was the hardest because the men never see a problem. They don't know why they have to go to therapy. They don't want to go to therapy. They don't want marriage counseling. They don't want, it's like they, they fight everything. It's not most men. No, it's not everybody, but it's most men. Let me rephrase that. It's not every man, but it's most men. I've also had therapy sessions where the man was all in and the woman was like, I don't even know. But that was, those situations were obvious. Like the woman just didn't want the man. You know, you marry a man you cannot respect. Put that in the comment. When you marry a man that you don't respect, guess what happens? You spend your whole life trying to change the man because you don't respect this man. You don't think the man is good enough. So you spend your whole life trying to change the man. So I, I tell women, I tell single ladies, don't marry a man that you cannot submit to. If he's not a leader, if he's not this, he's not that, please don't go marry a man that you have to tell him how to become a leader. It defies the purpose. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your energy to be with a man that you cannot submit to. Excuse me. And a lot of women do this. And you end up getting hurt because you get with the man and then you want to control everything. You just stay by yourself. Just, just stay by yourself. Because you have an idea of what you want. Just be by yourself. Yeah, you don't respect the man. So what's the point? You don't trust them to lead the home. What's the point of you being with that person? You don't trust the man to lead the home. Why choose somebody that you're going to be telling them how to lead? If you know how to lead, wait for somebody who will come and lead you. So let me just say, a lot of the mistakes when it comes to marriage, we make them up front. It's not now that you're making the mistake. You made the mistake when you were dating. You made the mistake in your choice. You made the mistake. So now what? And that's what we're talking about tonight. What do I do now? <laughs> I'm frustrated. I'm tired of this marriage. Like, what do we do? It's a dead end. But know that there is hope. There is hope. And the hope is in the fact that you have to assess every situation and see, is there room for me to learn something? Change your mind and learn it. Get to that place where you anchor in something else. So that is why getting married without knowing your purpose is such a detriment. Because if you get married and you don't know who you are, who you're supposed to, because we marry for where we are. Rarely do we marry for where we're going because we don't know where we're going. <laughs> right? We don't know. Most of us are like, mm, we don't know where we're going. So you must marry for where you're going. That is why it is crucial for young ladies. And I keep saying young ladies because guess what? The difficulties I've experienced when it talk when it comes to helping couples and it's always been women who have issues. The men have issues too, but the, the, the difference is that most men don't get help. They don't get help. You know how they get help? They go cheating, they go talking to female friends, they go doing they, they go create more problems. <laughs> 
because they want temporary fixes. They want quick fixes. But with marriage, there's no quick fixes. It's working on it every day, so we can't take a break from marriage. We don't take a break and say, okay, I'm going to go to school for one year, and then when I come back, I'll take up my relationship. Or I'm going to, no, you make a mistake and go anywhere for one month to take a break. Like, I'm busy for one month, working, working. You live in the home, but you're working, working, working. By the time you open your eyes, you're like, whoa, what happened to our relationship? It was only a month ago. You don't take breaks from marriage. It's every single day. Every day. No, you're not having sex every day. But what you're doing every day is you're communing with one another. You're talking to one another. If you don't talk to God every day, you see how your life is dry? It's the same way. Once you build that intimacy, you can't go a day without talking to God. It's the same way with your spouse. You go a day without talking to them, you will feel it because you have intimacy, real intimacy with this person. And you can't go by ignoring them, not talking to them, and, you know, living together and not talking for weeks. And personally, we, we have never experienced that. But the one time we experienced it, it led to some pretty <laughs> bad things. So if you're here and you haven't read my book, this is my newest book. I don't know if you can see it. The newest book I wrote is called The Death and the Resurrection of Marriage. The Death and Resurrection of Marriage. For those who have read it already, it was launched two weeks ago. For those who have read it already, it's just been, I mean... They need to put the reviews on Amazon, but the view the reviews have been awesome. They've texted me, they've called me, um, but it's it's really been phenomenal. Um, that this book, what this book was raw, and I wrote the book as I explained in the book that the Lord asked me to write this book, and I was very reluctant. It took me months before I took pen to paper. I think it was six months after I heard the voice to, to write the book, um, to actually write it because it was so graphic, right? It was so raw. Um, and I wasn't sure that I wanted to share my life with the world. Um, but then he gave me um, John chapter 12, verse 24, which says, except a grain of wheat falls to the ground. And dies, it abideth alone. But if it falls, it brings forth much fruit. In other words, your marriage, which at this point was dying, <laughs> is going to be the sacrificial lamb. This marriage, you have to reveal what happened in your marriage so other people can see it and learn from it. So my vulnerability is so that you don't have to suffer and go through what I went through. My vulnerability is so that you can come out resurrected and alive. You can come out restored and believing when I tell you there is restoration for your marriage. There is restoration. I don't want to spoil the book. Like a good movie, if I tell you what happened, you're not going to read the book. <laughs> if you want to know what really happened, you got to pick up your book on Amazon. The Death and Resurrection of Marriage. If you click on my, the link in my bio, you can order the book tonight. Order your book. Send it to a single person. I tell, I tell like, people are saying, oh, it's for married people. No, it's for single people. <laughs> we want to save you single people. So, no. Go ahead and order your book. Um, my books are not books that, this is my second book. My books are not books that you have to read for one week. No, you sit and you begin to read it. You, you will keep reading. You won't stop. If I don't feel too exhausted, I may read the introduction for you before we go. Just the introduction before we go. But this book, I read it four times and I am amazed. And I'm more grateful because... I know I didn't write every word. The Holy Spirit helped me write the word. <laughs> Everything in it. And I'm so grateful because this book was forwarded by an amazing prophet of the Lord. His name is Prophet Achu Manasseh. He is in Ghana, West Africa. 
one of the biggest prophets in the world. Okay, so the um, prophet Manasseh from Watered Garden Ministries forwarded this book. I'm telling you, and the things he wrote in his foreword taught me. He talks about how marriage is a miracle. Oh my goodness. And I said, yes, I get it now. It's a miracle because something dies and it resurrects. And what dies? <laughs> my voice has changed. It's probably going lower. What changes? What dies? Is your flesh. Your flesh must die. Your flesh must die. If your flesh doesn't die in your marriage, I'm telling you, you just won't make it. Your flesh must die. Once your flesh dies, your marriage will resurrect because God will give it life and it will give it life more abundantly. So do not miss it. Do not get distracted and say, oh, my spouse did this and they did that. And see your spouse. The issue isn't your spouse. There is an enemy against your marriage and it's not your spouse. And I need you to understand that. That the enemy is fighting. The enemy is fighting against your marriage. It's the enemy fighting against... I found against this on the web. Your enemy is fighting against the marriage. And don't tell yourself, don't keep telling yourself that, you know, it, it's, it's like, it's not your spouse. It's not your spouse. So I need you to bear that in mind and keep that in mind as you go through your relationship with your spouse. Guys, I'll be coming live every Monday at 9 o'clock. Calendar it. We'll be talking about some serious things, okay? Like I said, I'm going to show up, even if not in the best of conditions with technology, I'm going to show up because you need to hear this. You really need to hear this. If you read this book, after reading this book, your faith will be built in another measure. <laughs> like, your faith will grow. You, you will believe in God again. I'm telling you, if you, you were struggling with your faith. Let me give you the titles. I'll give you the titles. Um, the, the table of content for my book. Good night. Thanks for joining. Here's the table of content for my book. Number one. Chapter one is the disruption. Chapter two is the miscarriage. I remember talking to someone who said to me, oh, you don't understand. If you understood, you would know. You do know how hard it is to go through a miscarriage. And I was like, I do, but oh, you have no idea. You've never gone through it. A lot of times people go through a situation and they want others to go through before they can attest to it. Some of us don't wear our pain on our sleeves. And I'm not saying that you should be hiding your pain. I'm not hiding the pain, but this is something that happened to me as well. You know, and I've known plenty of women who have had miscarriages and that could have never been my story. At least in my mind, I was like, never me. Oh, no, no. I will never go through such a thing. So, like I said, if I tell you the book, you're not you're not going to read it. So go and find out the issues that I went through, difficult issues in marriage that I went through. Um, it's all in the book. And chapter three, the death. The death is chapter three. And four, the search for clarity. And then five, an ordained love story. When you read our love story, my husband and I, we have an amazing love story. From day one, there's no doubt that God was in it from day one. And if you've never read our story, just for the love story, please get the book. <laughs> and that's chapter five. You can go straight to chapter five. If you're single, you're like, oh, I don't know. I've been.